but it is. Uh, feel like I what I'm trying to explain. If, if I could at least oh, yeah. have. Yeah. Um, so you are going to make the area? Work? Yes, I could. And because, well, so unless, like, you know, the thing is, that's the thing we should all agree on. So I can come up with my idea and present it to you on the page. So if you don't agree, yeah, and we don't agree, then we tell you, and then yes. you can work on again. What kind of area? The 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 interview, the interview and, areas. and the rest of us just thought yeah. about why doing this interview and we'll put, we'll put it on paper and then we can decide which information you use. And <laughs> and one, one valid point for yeah. me, one valid point for me. Yeah, and then we can see on paper and we talk about it. And maybe we can meet on topic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I we have it. So on nice on the thing, nice thing. On topic, and I'll very Good morning, everybody. Yesterday we finished uh, curriculum. We finished all our test exercises. So today it's open for questions for you. Uh, I'm fully aware of that this is your first exam here. Uh, it is also, I would expect, for some of you, maybe your first exam in written English. Hands up. Yeah, okay. So, do you find that a problem? No. no. Okay. You're confident <laughs> that you're able to express express yourself in English? But, uh, I have done some of the uh, English examination, examination in English, but you know, I saw some of the academic words that you put in the questions and some of them I yeah, but uh, you know my 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 solution attempts is mine. Okay, you don't write l write like me, and you okay. shouldn't uh, you shouldn't try to do that. Okay, you write in your own words. That's uh, the point is that you must express the answers to the question in a way that I can understand. Okay, and of course, if I don't understand it, I may I may interpret it. Okay, normally in a favorable f position for you. Okay, so I don't I don't think you should be afraid of that. In general, when there are exams, there are some rules to 
be aware of. Uh, always try to answer all questions. Never put anything blank. That's uh, never a good strategy. Even though if you just paint a sun, it's better than nothing. Okay. So uh, try to answer something. Okay. That's uh, because if you answer nothing, you get nothing. Okay. It's very rare that you're able to uh, to get. Uh, a negative consequence of answering a question. In general, I would say that is is, is basically positive. So, so uh, mark my words. Try to answer all exercises. Okay. Do not leave anything blank. That's always a good strategy. Remember to bring your calculator. I, it's not necessary, as we said yesterday, that it should be advanced at all. Um. In general, I try to make ex uh, exams by starting out easy and trying gradually to progress difficulty as we move along in the same exercise. Okay, so if it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, the idea is to try to increase difficulty slowly with increasing dif difficulty through the exercise. Sometimes that's not possible due to various stuff, so it could be that it kind of jumps a little bit back and forth, but that's the general idea. <coughs> and as we said so yesterday on the, the example, I always put percents on each exercise, so to give you an indication of, of, uh, of which exercise is most important. In general, this is done uh, mostly by simply counting the sub-questions. Okay, so if one exercise has twice the number of sub-questions as another one, then it's twice as important. In some cases it may be that certain exercises, if from my point, are judged slightly more difficult, and in that case that may be reflected in the percentage. But that's fairly rare. And please try to write clearly you know, you use a pen here or a pencil or whatever, okay, and, uh, and please don't write ugly, okay? If I can't understand what you read, then it's hard for me to judge it, okay? Okay, questions? Yes, Kelly? I think it's on video, actually. Yeah. So yeah. you can catch up with it. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My question is: uh, I, one time I did ask you. We di we've done like I say how many chapters now, and it's not it's not the thing we should uh, have the whole how many chapters we did in inside here. So I was wondering, could you be specific or narrow it down to maybe <laughs> chapter three? To chapter one. Or chapter one only. Just chapter one. Ah, okay. Uh, I, I don't want to narrow it down, okay? Um, yeah, because for some of us, like me, microeconomics is just the first time I'm doing it, actually. So, no basic... Yeah, your question is, what do you need to remember? Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In principle, you need to remember everything, okay? On chapter one, yeah? Yeah, and on chapter <laughs> two, and chapter <laughs> three, and chapter four, and chapter six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, okay? okay. And uh, in addition, you should also consider remembering the guest lecture from Mr. Sondre Kofi, which also is on video if you haven't, if you didn't attend it, because that's also a part of this course. Um, uh, hopefully, I think I will leave this to you, okay? Um, there are some obvious things you have to remember, okay? You have to remember that if you draw the supply curve and the demand curve, this crossing point means something. Okay, that's the equilibrium point. And you need to be able to draw this, you need to be able to calculate it math mathematically, you need to be able to handle situations where we make changes from a given situation with supply and demand, where we kind of either push the demand up or down, or the supply up or down, and look at the consequences of this. You need to be able to relate that to practical economical situations. In a sense, what does this mean? 
You need to know how to handle monopoly, mathematically and graphically. You need to have some understanding of uh, the contents of chapter 9, of regulation. What happens if we put up a maximum or minimum price? What happens if we introduce taxes? What happens if we look at import quotas or uh, what, what taxes on products? What did you just say? What did I say? What did you just say? Was it monopoly or what is the issue? No, I, s I started we need, to, uh, we need to understand chapter 10, which is monopoly, uh, both graphically and mathematically. But then I moved into chapter 9, which is about regulation, and there are ver various stuff we need to be able to, to handle there. Of course, uh, the understanding here, as you saw on yesterday's uh, exam we looked at, or uh, the kind of structure here, or what kind of optimization problems are needed to to um, yeah. <coughs> Maybe we should look at it again. To a great extent, the, the, the three optimization problems from exercise two here kind of sums up this course. The first one uh, is the starting point to derive the demand curve. And you kind of have to solve these three and four numbered equations here repeatedly by changing one of the prices, registering the demand or the x. If, if we change px here, the price of good x, and, and then solve this, then we obtain an x star, or an optimal amount of x. And that optimal amount of x is then linked to the given price. Then we change the price to another price, get a new x, and so then we kind of build the demand curve, the link between p, x, and x in this situation. Now don't be confused by the letters here, okay? We, we normally use q, don't we? p or q when we talk about demand. But when we do utility maximization, we, we need to have two products. So then we normally use other letters than this Q. But what by changing this PX, registering X, re resolving this problem, we end up with a table of P and X, or P and Q, if you like. Okay, so that is the demand curve. The, the two final problems here sums up the second part of what we looked at, which is chapters 6 seven and eight actually. So the first one is discussed in chapters two, three and four. The two last problems is discussed in chapters six, seven and eight. And the idea there is to, to arrive uh, uh, at a supply curve. <coughs> and uh, as opposed to the demand side, we have to kind of do a stepwise double optimization here. So the first problem is a cost minimization problem and the idea then is to arrive at a at the function, <coughs> actually, this function, it's, it says C O Q here. We, we in, in the textbook, we used T C O Q, the total cost. So by solving these problems repeatedly, finding <coughs> L star and K star, which produces a minimal cost here for different values of these, these, uh, these Q. Of course, we can register the result here, the cost, for different values of Q. This registry or table produces this one, which is needed to kind of find the supply curve. Here we maximize profits for an individual producer, and uh, and, uh, and we arrive at the solution where price equals marginal cost, and then we do a kind of added argument where uh, where we pick out certain parts of this marginal cost curve and define that as the supply curve. So this is kind of the rough content of chapters 1 up to and including 8. Okay, In chapter 9 we looked at, at regulation, meaning that we are kind of back to the 
to this uh, perfectly competitive situation and we start discussing what happens if we force the price to be lower, if we force the price to be higher, if we put taxes on various stuff here, if there is tariffs or import quotas on imported or exported products. And then finally in chapter 10 we move to another situation where there is a single producer and discuss monopoly and also monopsony then, even though this monopsony part is perhaps not very important. So this kind of uh, rough content, okay? It's I think it's a good idea to have this content in your head, okay? Then it's easier to kind of, if you look at an exercise, okay, this must be from that chapter, okay? I think that's a good way to prepare. Try to organize the content of the course in your head. And the best way of doing that is reading the book and trying to kind of pinpoint what uh, how this content relates to the kind of big plan here. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to do that? What do we arrive at? I think that's uh, the best way to prepare. And of course you must be prepared that some of the exercises here are kind of linked to the main focus of this course, which is kind of dual, it's microeconomics kind of in the sport and event scene, so to speak. So, so there may be some questions on the exam which is kind of linked to differences between sport and event situations and, and other situations. For instance, is, is demand curves different in sport event situations than in, say, the car market? And we have discussed this, haven't we? They we, we assume perhaps that sport, leisure and entertainment are more price sensitive than other products. So if the price of entertainment goes up, then more people avoid buying it, okay? As opposed to, the, let's say, the electricity or oil or whatever. So th this is something which is typical for this, what we often call high-end products, modern products, service-based products, which are kind of more volat volatile related to price changes. And of course, on the supply side, on the production side, there are major differences between the sport and event seen, seen on one side and on, should we say, traditional manufacturing on the other side. We don't have factories in the sport event scene, do we? No. Okay, we don't have, what do you call it, conveyor belts. You know what a conveyor belt is? It's a kind of belt, okay? So if you, if you assemble a car, then you start at the end and somebody starts putting in the engine and then it moves on and then they put on the chassis and, oh, and so all this kind of stuff, okay? And we don't have that. so. So there's a lot of differences between these, should we say, modern type of markets, sport and event markets, related to the other extreme of manufacturing markets. And knowing these differences, being able to point at them in certain situations is of course relevant in this course. <coughs> General economic theory at least classically, is a lot focused on these general equilibrium models. Okay. And in a general equilibrium model, the problem of defining prices is not very relevant, is it? Because the price is given in the market. Okay. So if you are in a perfectly competitive market, you just have to take the price as it is. But if you move into our segment of sport and event events, then of course pricing is much more relevant. Which price should you put on your product? Because you can and should do that. We haven't discussed that much in this course, but this will be much more of a topic in the following course to this one, where uh, pricing decisions will be important. How to change prices, how to put prices, should you use dynamic prices, should you use bundling, for instance. So there's a lot of uh, different problems there that, that will be discussed and analyzed, but we have not focused on that. So this is kind of just a stepping background. So now you should know what demand is, what supply is, what kind of connects them to these different two market extremes. Okay, that was a long answer to no question. Or uh, maybe it was a question, Kelly. <laughs> Yeah, the general idea is you should, of course, remember as much as possible. That makes you best prepared to handle the exam. 
That's the same for a football player, isn't it? The faster he runs, the better he passes, the better he is able to pass his opponent, the better he's the, pr the higher probability he has to succeed in a match. Okay, but still he he's not guaranteed to succeed, is he? Just like you, okay. So your only option is to prepare as good as you can. Okay. I can't tell you what you should prepare more on and less on. Of course I can, but I don't know the exam yet, so it wouldn't matter anyway, would it? I haven't made it, so I have to ma make the exam first. Then of course I can answer, you don't need to <laughs> read chapter 5. Or I can that anyway, because that's not a part of the curriculum. But that's just how it is, okay? And as I said yesterday, if you, if you feel nervous about this, that's good, okay? Because that's... That's the body's mechanism of preparing you, okay? But don't be nervous, this will be easy, okay? I'm a nice guy, you know that, don't you? <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I'm not after finding out what you cannot, okay? I try to, to make an exam that kind of makes it possible for you to show what you understand. There are two angles of making an exam, either trying to find out what the students cannot, or trying to find out what they can. I always choose the second alternative. But of course, at the same time, I have to kind of rank you, okay? So there must be some difficult exercises here, which I, with great probability, know that most of you are not able to do. The trick is of, of often to kind of get these, should you say, difficult questions, not too difficult, because then you kind of, you're not able to use them in the ranking. So somebody will have to be able to do also the difficult tasks. So that, that's kind of the, the, the great challenge for me in kind of constructing the exam. <coughs> but I, I'm get starting to get routine on this now, so I kind of know what people, students, I, roughly of course, when I, when I teach a general course in my, microeconomics like this, I know that most students don't understand anything. Okay? So if you feel the same, then we kind of agree on this one. Okay? That's normally how it is. Okay? Microeconomics is a difficult topic, okay? Maybe one of the most difficult, among all topics. It combines mathematical skills, modeling skills, and should we say some skills related to, to society, um, social science. This combination is often very tricky, okay? So this is not, not li like simple mathematics where you just read, learn some rules and try to prove something, okay? You kind of have to put things together in some, to sometimes, in some, in some situations, quite complex uh, stuff. Any other questions? Now is your chance, okay? Yes? I, 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 you know my ears. What did you say? Uh, it is important to have formulas and definitions memorized. Yeah, okay. it is. And According to what I said, and you, you see, yeah. but yeah. you see, you don't need many formulas in this exam, do you? You need one. You need to know that. If you look at it, <coughs> the need for formulas here is linked to the first exercise. and it's needed here you need to know that the intersection between the two curves that's one piece of information you need the second piece of information is need, needed in order to solve b here you need to put that one equal to that one okay but that is something you definitely should know by now okay you don't need to repeat that to the exam so that is the information you need of mathematical nature here okay and then there is some verbal questions here of course, the next piece of information you need is to need how to co compute consumer and producer surplus, okay? So you need to know that given if, if the situation is, is, is as it is here, you need to know how to find the area of a triangle. Okay. Of course, if you arrive at the exam and forget that, then of course you just draw it and say, I forgot that, okay? In that case, you, you get some points, but not all points, okay? Then we move to the monopoly situation, of course, then you need to know 
the tricks in trade of monopoly. You need to know how to form the profit. You need to know that in order to maximize profit, you need to take the first order derivative, equate to zero, and solve for that. Okay, that's principally what you need here. At this point, it starts get getting tricky. Okay, as we discussed yesterday, then it's kind of more for those who are really good at this. Okay, and then if you see here, I, I of course you need to be able to identify these problems here. Okay. The idea of doing it like this was to make it easy for the students, okay? The alternative would be to write something like, write up the three most important optimization problems, okay? That would be tougher. And then you need to draw some figures. So both this mathematical ability as well as graphical ability is kind of needed here. And I want to test you on, on that. But if you see, if you sum up, it's really not many formulas you need to remember here to be able to get a full A plus on this exam here. So I do not put emphasis on mathematics as such. Never. That makes no sense. It's just as a tool. Okay. Are you happy with my answer? What was your name again? Caroline. Caroline. You're from France. No. You're from Germany then. Yeah. Okay. That's why you speak so good English perhaps. What happened to the French students? Have they left us? <laughs> <laughs> they left after the first lecture. They did? Okay. Do you speak with them? Are they still here? Yes. Okay, so they are not back to France. No. Uh, there are some students who applied to, to get rid of this course. Maybe there are some of them. I don't know. You know that you always have that option? A bit late now, perhaps, to tell you. <laughs> If you have had the microeconomic courses before, you can, of course, apply and to kind of drop this Excel. On the yeah. yeah, other questions? Yeah? Uh, yeah, Caroline? Earlier you said that uh, sports are uh, price sensitive, right? I said that. Mm -hmm. That sports are price sensitive? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sport events? Um, I would actually think the other way around. I you would think? think that they are not price sensitive because fans are loyal and you don't really have a uh, substitute. So how? Why are they? Why are those uh, price sensitive? Because they are not necessary. Are they? they are not necessary. Oh yeah. No, if you take the income of a person, okay? Suppose you earn uh, a million Norwegian crowns and you say, no, tomorrow you will earn 200,000 only. What will you start taking out of your basket? So they are luxury goods? Yeah, in a sense, they are, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the main argument there. But of course, as you say, you can argue the other way around, can't you? Good point, okay? Of course, given a situation with strong fan lo loyalty, of course, a very football-oriented husband, may choose to go to his matches, drink his beer while his family is starving. We see examples of that, don't we? Yeah, okay, so there, but that's kind of a different story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who else are we missing? We're missing the French. Uh, it seems to be missing the, the Czechs as well. No, you're here. Yeah. But uh, this girl, Veronica, she's not here. Yeah, you're here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So what about this video? Does it have any impact on whether to show up on the lectures? It gives you an option of not showing up, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's very good because then if you leave someone and something out, you can just go back. Sure, it's efficient, isn't it? You can come here and do it, and then you don't have to. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, the idea with these videos is, of course, not that people should, shouldn't go to the lectures, okay? That's not the point. The point is that in the Hopefully you can see some news in it now, okay? Before the exam you can look at the videos and that could perhaps give you some some aid in the understanding of this. The main point is of course to understand this, okay? That's that's the main point. That's what we try to test you in your understanding of microeconomic theory related to sport and events. Yeah, it, I don't feel a rush, a big demand here for my services today. But as I said, if some of you feel more comfortable discussing it with me alone, that's of course an option. 
I have the feeling that some of you struggle a little bit with English and if you had been able to communicate better you might have been more active here but that's just how it is isn't it you just have to learn get secure keep on speaking writing English and of course that's a very important part of a problem like program like this to be much more fluent in English learn mm -hmm. English better which is a, it's a nice side effect an external effect could we call that couldn't we we talked slightly about this concept of external effects didn't we in this course effects who are kind of not intended by production I gave you the example of my neighbor who has a Ferrari okay I can watch the Ferrari and get happy but that was not his intention what he wanted to hire a Ferrari so this is a positive external effect on me okay of course for you learning better and more English is a positive external effect the idea with this master program is basically not to learn your English okay but I assume most of you will learn English better which is always a good thing isn't it learn as many languages as you can the more the better these lazy <laughs> Americans of course they have no help from this because they already speak English or actually they speak American so what how would you how would you say my dialect is Eric is it more American or more English It seems pretty English, okay. You don't use many British words that I don't know. I don't think. So it's, yeah, yeah. I spent some time in Scotland actually, many years ago. Maybe that's the reason. But I definitely. Yes? Question. It's only a little one. Is it possible to have an upward sloping demand curve? We discussed it. But an upward sloping demand curve, if that is possible? Yeah. <laughs> we talked about luxury products, didn't we? Yeah, we about so luxury products can produce an upward sloping demand curve, definitely. So, uh, but that's perhaps not typical on the sports scene. It could be, perhaps, on the events scene in certain situations. But we see very <laughs> peculiar situations from time to time, even in the sports scene. But the idea then is, of course, that the higher the price is, the more people will buy the product. And that is kind of a, a violation of the greed principle, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, but, uh, but it, it's possible in the sense that uh, if you look at this in a more advanced way, if you look at a signaling mechanism where kind of buying the product gives some added signal value, okay? So instead of going around with a, a big uh, sign saying, I'm rich, you can do it more elegantly by buying a Prada bag, okay? And then of course that could produce an added price or added value to the consumer which kind of reflects the price. So it's more like we perhaps don't have the right models to to explain this behavior in this version of economic theory. If you start digging into modern game theory then these kind of problems are very well described and explained. We refer to it as signaling games. Many people say that education is a signaling game. Okay. What that means is that uh, it doesn't really matter what you learn. The education is just a signal. I have a master from MIT. Okay. What I learned at MIT doesn't matter. I proved that I'm good enough to both enter MIT and take my master, maybe even with honors. And that signal is is what's value for me and my relation to the labor market. So whether I know mathematics or not doesn't really matter. Okay? Do you see what I'm trying to explain to you now? The point of taking education is more like a qualification process than a relearning process. Okay? If I have a master from MIT, then I have proved that I'm able to come in there in competition with a lot of good students, meaning that I have to be a good student. I have proved to potential future employers that I am probably able to learn a lot very fast. And that is kind of what the labor market demands, isn't it? Your ability to learn something new. So, so whether you actually know when you go out of these doors, whether you remember that you have to look at the crossing point between demand and supply, that doesn't really matter because you can always get that information at any point in time. 
and you also by now know how to get that information. Of course, you pr probably did it, knew it already before you entered here. Okay, I'm uh, moving in uh, other directions now. Sorry. Other questions? Yeah. yeah? What do you need about elasticities? Yeah, you need to know the formulas. But uh, depending, well, if I choose to ask you about elasticity, then I probably will give the formulas on the exam, I think, okay? But you know, it's... Uh, I, never, I never remember what's on top here. Either it's like this, or it's the other way around. The other way around, okay? I trust you here. Yeah, it's the other way around, you're right. But uh, it's always such that... Uh, no, so sorry. It's always, that was my point. It's always such that they, they kind of mix here. So if you do Q over P, it's P over Q there. Or the other way around, okay? But I think this is the correct one. And then you have this, this form. So this is if you have kind of a continuous function here, this is if you have just observations in the table, if you like, okay? That's basically what you need to know. And we had, um, we did a little bit in chapter 10, didn't we? Where we kind of wrote the monopoly price like this. What was it like this? Or was it the minus here? I think it was a minus actually. No, it was a plus, yeah. Which is a kind of handy way, in some cases, to find the monopoly price, given that you have the information of the marginal cost and the elasticity. That's basically, in general, what you need to know about elasticities, I think. Of course, you need to know basically what they mean, okay? They say something about these curves, whether they are closer to horizontal or more steep. Okay, and then we have both elasticities for supply and demand, of course. Or in principle, any curve, where which kind of is a two-variable connection, you can define an elasticity, no matter what it is. <coughs> okay. You can follow one step, yeah. but we cannot leave that, okay? Yeah, and what chapter? Chapter 3. Chapter 3? Yeah. Let's see, we can find out. No, it was 2. It was 2, okay, then we go back to 2. Mm -mm -mm. Here it is. Maybe it's an error, who knows? That happens from time to time. Ah, oh, it's coming up here, isn't it? This was chapter two. Here's chapter two. Okay. Uh, the far end of the presentation. The far end? Yeah. Not here, not there, yeah. not here. This part? Yeah. Okay. The Let's start here, okay? The idea here is that by the aid of elasticities and an equilibrium point, we are able to derive supply and demand curves given that supply and demand curves are linear. Okay? Because then we, we know that the demand curve can be written like this, Q equals to A minus BP, where A and B are now unknown. And then the supply curve can be written as B plus C. Yeah, this D. is yeah, the C. Hmm? C plus D. Yeah, this is an error, isn't it? It should be C. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are more errors here. I haven't been fixing these up. I'm lazy. Uh, let, me, let me do it now before it's too late. Okay. 
C. There, then it's C, then we save this one file, uh, save as. Uh, this is always good. E to sound E. -E. What kind of name is this? Mm, okay, we can fix that later on. And then the next slide. Okay, so that is the point. So we want to find this A, B, C, and D, which are four unknowns. So we need to construct four equations basically. And that's what we do in the next slide here. Based on the knowledge of these elasticities of 1.5 and minus 0 0.5, as well as the equilibrium point of Q star equals to 12 and P star equals to 2. Then we start by finding the derivative we are looking for, okay? We need to find this part, dq dp. Okay, that's the first thing we do. So we, we take derivatives of this expression with respect to variable p, and that is minus b, okay? We do the same for the supply curve. Take derivatives of q with respect to variable p, and then d is the result of that, okay? And then we know that these formulas for elasticities can be applied because this derivative now has got values. The first one is minus b, the second one is d. And then we can put that directly into the formula and add these 2 and 12, which are the p and q. Okay? We do the same. And then, of course, by this equation, we can find b. We can solve for b because this one should equal minus 0 0.5 by the initial information. We can solve for b here, and b, b turns out to be minus 3, it says it. It should be plus 3, shouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. So we have to change that as well. Sloppiness. Like that. Okay. Then that errors. Okay, and then we do the same for the supply part. Uh, if you take it up uh, here, and then we, we the derivative is d. We should multiply it by this rational of uh, p over q, isn't it? Yeah, two over twelve. It should that in that case equal. 1.5 and that produces a d equal to 9. So now we have found two our unknowns b and d. Okay, so we're lacking a and c. There should be some blanks here. That seems to have vanished. Okay, I don't know why. So now we have an equilibrium point, meaning that both these two curves should go through this point. This point of q equal to 12 and p equals to 2. And now we have found B and D, so now we can kind of return to these curves. These two are now known. These two are remaining. And we can put Q equal to 12 and P equal to 2 in both of these equations to produce the two final equations to solve for A and C. So we enter 12 equals to A minus, and this minus is given al already, so this is correct, okay? This minus 3 doesn't kind of reflect back here into it. So it's, no, it's times 2, and then we get 12 equals to a minus 6, and a equals then 12 plus 6, which is 18. And finally, 12 equals to c plus 9 times 2. And the 9 comes from the d, of course, we previously found. And that produces 12 equals to c plus 18, and c then ends up being 12 minus 18, which is minus 6. Okay, and then we have everything. We have found 18 for A, 3 for B, so the demand curve is 18 minus 3P, and the supply curve would be minus 6, which is C plus 9 times P. So that solves it. Was, were you curious about this minus 3, perhaps? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Because this was the step I yeah. yeah. It's always good to do it right, okay? It's easy to understand then if it's when it's type of thing. I'm sorry about this, okay? My fault. So let's all save it and upload it. 
What was the names here actually? Yeah, it has this name. I T O S A N D E E. It's an abbreviation for something, perhaps introduction to sport and event economics. Ah. Ah, it was a logic here. Great. So chapter two must be deleted. I am sure about this. Yeah. Okay, and then I must up, up upload the correct version, which is here. Hopefully. There it is. Open. Save. Sorry, it's in Norwegian now. So the new version now is here, so that's okay. Thanks a lot. I always remember your name. You're from Germany, aren't you? What was your name again? Thomas. Thomas, yeah. Thanks a lot, Thomas. You pointed out some important points here. Okay. Should we take a break? Shall we shall we shall we continue? Do you need a break to f to f come up with some more questions? Okay, we take a break.